Hello and welcome back. So it's kind of a triple celebration for me. A few days ago I crossed my 1024 subscriber goal. My processor is now Turing complete and we are at the one year anniversary of my first processor build video. So I kind of posted a video a few days ago requesting some questions for a Q&A session and so that's what this is. So I'm a bit worried about how long this video is going to end up. I've got about 20-ish questions, so let's jump straight into it. This first one's from DJ Kizmo. Do you work as a computer engineer? How did you learn about this computer stuff? Kind of. I work as a programmer, but I've got a speciality in kind of engine programming and low-level optimization. So you kind of have to pick up quite a lot about the kind of low-level internals of the way computers work to do that effectively. I started off with a degree, but a, a lot along the way has been just kind of on-the-job and self-taught experience. Bootgamer ER writes, how does one get the idea to build a CPU? That's not really easy to answer, but I've kind of had an interest all along, and so I've, I've kind of had thoughts along this direction for years, but the kind of spark that lit the fire was a video series by a YouTuber called Ben Eater, which I strongly recommend if you're interested in this problem space. He made a video where he built a very simple breadboard computer, and he's an amazing educator, so he kind of filled in a lot of the little blanks on the electronic side of things, which is where I was lacking knowledge. And once you've kind of get that piece of the puzzle, it was churning around in my head. And I was thinking about the other bits of architecture, like the pipeline I'd love to mess around with and get a deeper understanding of. And so the kind of rough layout design of what I've built started to form in my head and I had to uh, give it a crack. Lewis Moton asks, how far are you going to go with the CPU? As in, how many instructions will you end up performing? And are you converting everything to PCBs now that the circuit is finished? I said in my intro video that I wouldn't really consider it was complete until I could develop a game for it. And so exactly how far that takes me is still to be determined, but I will need to add a bit of sound and some graphical capability to it. Number of instructions is, it's close to being finished in terms of the core architecture. There's some stuff I'm still going to be adding, such as some stack instructions, call and return, and a couple of other bits of basic functionality, but a lot of the core is there now. In terms of going to PCBs, yes. I think I'm not going to achieve what I want in terms of performance until I've got the, the circuits that are on breadboard converted over into PCB and kind of debugged electrically and a higher you know, speed, higher performance um, in terms of clock rate will, will let me achieve something a bit more interesting in terms of execution. NinjaRoo88. Would you consider redesigning your CPU PCBs to four layers, simplifying the grounding issue and improving signal integrity? Yes and no. I've obviously had some problems recently with some ground noise. So your question about um, four layer PCBs with a nice solid ground and power planes is pretty apt. Now, what I'm looking at doing is not redesigning my main register boards because they, they work fine, but the bus control board where a lot of my critical edges are generated, which I've already said I want to remake, I will look seriously at doing a four layer one there in order to uh, resolve those issues. But thanks for the input. There's a bit of a wall of text here from Digicool Things. I'm curious, what got you started on your YouTube CPU building journey? What's your background in terms of electronics and digital design experience? And then he goes on to ask whether or not the CPU building provides the onus for making the YouTube content or vice versa. The YouTube thing, I'll be honest, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Electronics and digital design, not a lot. I mean, I had a few electronics kits as a kid and I certainly found it interesting, but I can't say I 
developed a particularly deep knowledge of any of it. I kind of got interested in computers and programming and, and went down that route. But the whole YouTube experience is, is actually great. It's uh, lots of feedback. It's like having a big friendship group who are really interested in my kind of personal project. And that's awesome because while some of my friends have uh, done a good job of faking interest, you know, their heart's not in it in the same way other people who share that common interest online are. So that's pretty awesome. James Robinson asks, do you buy breadboards by the case? Do you have nightmares your setup falls off the desk? I think the largest group of breadboards I bought was a pack of five, which I've done a few times. So I've got quite a lot more than you've ever seen in one place, but that's partially because I keep the older circuits around for a while as reference. I haven't really had nightmares. I definitely get a kind of a creeping concern when I'm doing one of those jobs that involve me disassembling the whole thing and then putting it back together later. Ajinka Mahajan has a question. Can you connect a PS2 keyboard as input and a VGA or composite video output to the pipeline CPU? I think the protocol for a PS2 keyboard is fairly straightforward serial. So I've not given it much thought, but it's um, certainly achievable. The VGA, well, in one of my first mailbag videos, I pulled out the bag a 25.175 megahertz crystal. So that should give you a bit of a clue on where I'm going with that. Dustin Watts wants to know, after adding RAM, what other plans do you have? Okay, so now I've got RAM, there's a few more bits of functionality I'm going to add. I've already mentioned the stack operations and function calling, but then there's going to be a kind of a whole process of, of programming it up a bit more. It's kind of pointless to make a pipeline processor and not develop some bigger programs that really take advantage of that. But in future, I've talked about display and sound, and there's going to be a whole kind of phase of converting it over to PCBs. So there's going to be some different stuff in there, and I'm, I hope people continue to find it interesting. Gerald42 asks, has the build process influenced your coding? If so, how? I don't know how much it's influenced my day-to-day -day programming. I think there's always an element where the more you understand the underlying functionality behind something you're developing for, the better it allows you to code. Although there's obviously aspects of the architecture of modern processors that go way beyond what I've touched on. So I don't know how useful it is there, but there are some very specific aspects. One of those is the difference between using a stack-based call and return and a return address-based call and return. And kind of thinking out that problem space and having a realization on how it could be done in the kind of architecture I've built was quite a, a big element of, uh, of why I kind of tipped over the edge into, yes, I'm going to build this thing. So that video is one that I'm finally quite close to in the next couple of weeks. So I'm hoping you'll find that interesting. The very aptly named 1024, have you ever thought about trying to simulate parts of your computer before building them? I'll be honest, I haven't uh, looked into simulating electronics very much. The kind of logical flow side of things is very similar to what I do from a programming perspective. And it's actually quite simple compared to a lot of the stuff I have to deal with. But the electronic side of things, um, particularly as it relates to things like the, the ground noise issues I've been dealing with recently, is very new to me. And I don't actually know what kind of tools there are for, for checking that. Um, if people have suggestions about stuff I should be looking at, chuck a comment down below. Frank Javartz has a question about the oscilloscope. Do you think the specs were right? Did you need the full 200 megahertz one or would a cheaper one have done the job? Okay, my choice on the scope wasn't so much a, a, a budget one because I had a kind of a budget range in mind. It was more between a case of the 200 megahertz two channel or a 50 or 100 megahertz with four channels. But I was specifically targeting a issue I had on those counter chips. And when I found the glitch, it was a, a very small spike. Probably it would have shown up on a 100 megahertz scope. 
I, I don't actually know, but looking at the, the, the size of the artifact that caused that problem, I certainly didn't look at it and think, well, you know, I don't need anything like 200 megahertz. So I like to think I make, made the right decision. Kyle Eames has two questions. Are you going to write and publish an emulator of your CPU so we can have something to play around with? What will be your final I.O. solution? Port I.O. or memory mapped I.O.? Will your architecture support branch and wait interrupts? That feels more like free. I'm not sure about an emulator. It would be quite a lot of effort and I'd rather focus my time on getting the build finished. It's taken a lot longer than I initially expected it to already. Now the I.O. I've got in there at the moment is essentially port I.O but I'm driving it from the demultiplexer I'm using to select registers. So I've got quite a limited number of ports and later on there will be some additional hardware that's mapped into memory addresses. Interrupts are difficult. With the pipeline, there's quite a lot of state through the pipe. And so if I kind of interrupted the instruction stream, I could potentially run into problems where bits of code didn't execute in exactly the same way. So I'm probably not going to do anything with interrupts in this build, but um, yeah, when I'm done, I might uh, might look at demonstrating some of the more complex stuff that you need to do to make that work, because I have given it some fault. It was just uh, a compromise to keep the build simple and achievable. Leonardo Nicholas also has several questions. What is the main goal of the CPU project? What kind of project are you making with the metal bars that you showed in your unboxing videos? And what software development projects are you working on? The main goal of the CPU project is very much a learning experience. But also, because I do so much work in software, you kind of end up with something that you can show on a screen, or maybe you've got the box that something is distributed in. But with the electronics build, you kind of end up with a physical artifact, and that's, that's quite an alluring project to have uh, to somebody who works in software all the time. Metal bars. Um, spoilers. I know some people have kind of guessed some aspects of that, but those bars relate to a couple of project ideas I've got. But there's some stuff in the general area of electroplating and also battery technology, which is basically just me playing around and trying to learn other stuff. Software projects. Um, I've put quite a bit of effort now into the assembler used in the processor build, but most of my programming is work and as a kind of a hobby experience that this is very much supposed to be, I don't necessarily want to come home at the end of the day and you know, do the same kind of stuff that I was doing at work. So I can talk about the work stuff a bit. I develop computer games. The game we've just finished, it's going to be coming out soon or by the time you see this it'll probably be out is um, a port job of a pre-existing game to a new platform which has been quite an interesting experience there's some unique features on that platform that I can't talk about without giving away what it is but uh, I'll maybe post a video when I've got official clearance to talk about it publicly The Unexpected Maker asks are you going to start changing your PCB colours for each revision like Julian does? No. I like what Julian's doing with that, but I don't think it's right for me. I did look at a colour scheme where I would have different types of modules, so registers would be one colour, ALU and NAVA, and then the control components a third colour. But I kind of played around in Photoshop and I didn't really like the look of it. So I'm going to go with a simple thing where the core processor components are all the same colour, but I'll do the back plane in a different colour and maybe some uh, secondary modules in, in a third colour, but it's mostly a stylistic choice. Adam Kerr asks, what sort of games do you work on? Have you been involved in the demo scene? What was your first love in computing, the moment you knew you were hooked? All sorts of games. If you look at the About page on my YouTube channel, there's the box art from a whole bunch of games I've worked on. But there's all kinds of bits of technical work on different titles, some of which is you're never going to have heard of it. So it's uh, 
very much a case of it's a job and I do what I get paid to do. I really enjoy it. It's very rewarding. But you, know, I don't always get a much choice in, in what I'm actually working on, as is always the way. See, when I was growing up, we didn't really have the internet in the way we do now. So I wasn't very aware of the demo scene. And by the time I kind of got to the later years in university and we started getting access to the internet, um, I was kind of very much focused on um, developing some technology that went on to get me my first job. The first computer I really had a chance to sit and code on was an Apple II that my dad used to bring home from work. And then a bit later, um, I got my first Spectrum as a Christmas present. And yeah, just the whole process of, you know, you write code and stuff happens on screen. It was, it felt like magic at the time and some days it still does. Detlev Mustinger has a simple request. Would you provide easy EDA and or Gerber files? Yes, I design all my PCBs on easy EDA and they've actually got a quite a nice system where you can share your projects out so people can clone them and mess around. So if you look down in the description, there's a link to my profile there and I've got a whole bunch of private projects which are kind of iterative progress on future bits of work, but the boards that I've shown on video, um, they're public. You can go and look at them, look at the schematics and the PCBs, clone them, play around with them, laugh at the mistakes. Knock yourself out, link in the description. Christian Iverson, no question here, just wanted to congratulate you. Thanks, Christian. Okay, David Clifford, he's got an interesting question. How fast do you think the maximum clock speed will be and will you be disappointed if it's slower than you expect? I've been asked about clock speed before. It's difficult. I definitely want to get as high as I can. And one thing I'm very keen on is when I hit a limit is being able to work out why that's the limit. The one thing I've been focused on so far is all of the chips come with data sheets so I can look up you know, the latency on this operation is this. So I can kind of try and trace a flow through the board on what the greatest path of dependency is. And so I've got a rough idea of an upper limit with that kind of knowledge that's around about four megahertz. So my kind of, my hope is to get about halfway there because that would let me cross the one MIPS boundary. That's probably about 1.3, 1.4 megahertz would get me to that. But really, there's probably some electrical reason that I don't currently understand and haven't touched on that's going to cap me slower. And you know, I'll be interested to find it when I get that far. So no disappointment, because there's going to be there's going to be learning whatever happens. And the final question comes from Maxint R and D. Will you make a game for this computer, and what will the first game be? Oh, absolutely. I've already mentioned in this Q and A session that I want to do that, but what it will be, I don't know yet. I haven't decided. There's going to be a big influence on that as to what the final clock rate is because that's going to determine you know, just how much I can do in a, in a frame. And so I'll kind of be targeting something suitable. But remember, this is a, an 8-bit era computer. So on a scale of Pong to Crisis, expect something closer to Pong. But if you think about the kind of games that we saw on the Spectrum or you know, the early Commodore machines, I'd, I'd like to knock something together in that general ballpark but I don't want to spend more time writing a game than uh, I spent developing the CPU because you know that would just be a massive gap before I show my final videos on it and I'd like to do something quite quick. So that's it for the questions. I want to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to everyone who's commented, liked or subscribed over the last year. The kind of the whole feedback is absolutely brilliant and it's uh, really encouraging and it makes putting the extra effort to make the videos uh, worthwhile. So I'm hoping you found this interesting. Thanks for watching and I'll be continuing with the build over the coming months. Goodbye.